extremely well. And yourself? I don't have no complaints. Well, I know you're busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I am. I am. I am. I am. Been working hard, real hard. Good, 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 good. Listen, as as fellow detectives on the job, actively here in the city, man, we commend you for what you do and uh, appreciate you coming in the office and, you know, making that change. Because that's exactly why we started the podcast, you know, bridging the gap for the people so they can know that, you know, there's real police officers that go out there and serve with a purpose and serve it right and do it day in and day out. That's what's going unnoticed, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I appreciate I really do appreciate the work you guys do. I know it's hard. I, I know I ain't no police officer. I know that much. Because some of the statements of facts I read, I'm like, first of all, I ain't going no midnight down the street. <laughs> Y'all got midnight. Woo! Nah, then you chase the dude with the gun. Nah, yeah. Nah, he's a special person. And I recognize that ain't me. Now, thank you for your service. Because uh, you put that right, work right. in too. Thank you. Thank you. Been, I've been blessed. Very blessed. How long have you had the uh, uh, podcast? Well, going on three and a half, four years now. Yes, sir. So on the podcast, we just showcase um, just active first responders and also people from the community that want to be a part of the change and contribute to the community. You know, we had likes of uh, T.J. Smith, our past commissioner, Daryl D'Souza, uh, so, so many great people, especially uh, John Bernthal, who's a phenomenal actor that was on, you know, we was all on We Own the City. So the podcast is doing a lot. It's changing the landscape of policing. And that's why we did it. So people could fully understand, you know, they're the real oh, wow. officers that do the job the way it's supposed to be done. That's what's up. Yeah, you definitely need some help with that. It's hard. Well, I know you all. I know you all too familiar with that. It's definitely tough, you know. It's not for everybody, but the chosen ones will get the job done. Yeah, that's true. Are y'all from Baltimore? No, nah, we from New York. Yeah, what part? I'm from Long Island. I'm I, 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 I'm a New York country boy, but Dre from the Bronx. <laughs> from the Bronx. Dre, you're from where? The Bronx. Yeah, the Bronx. And uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us as well. Absolutely. Nice. We have a little echo. Do you hear it? I'm sorry? Who? He said we got a little echo. echo? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Chris is, uh, we're fine tuning the things on our end so we could get, so we could begin. Okay. Can you hear us? Do you still hear the echo? Do, do you still hear the echo? No, it's gone. Okay, perfect. perfect. Oh, now it's back again. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, I hear it. Hello? Yeah, I hear it. How about now, sir? How you doing, Ivan? I'm good. I don't have any complaints. How you been, Kev? Good. Good, good, good. In Colorado, just did a little camping trip with the fam. Oh, that's good. Yeah, How about now? Man. Very good. chill. So, sounds like it's gone now. Sounds like it's gone? Yeah, it sounds better like it's gone now. Yeah. We can't hear him, though. All right, cool. Yeah, I went up to Boston for I never been to Boston. I know it's cold as I don't know what. I don't never need to go back there. Fourth of July and I'm cold like the fourth of July weekend. Uh, I was like, I just ain't for me. It's too cold. My little brother was on the trip with us and he wants to move to Boston after he graduates. And Pam lived there and she's like, Yeah, it gets real cold. I highly don't recommend that. You can hear me through the headphones. Yeah. I, I like it was really like it would be different if it got cold. It reminded me of San Francisco. Uh huh. San Francisco is getting a little cold. Yes, it does. We're gonna switch over to the headphones so that you don't hear the uh, echo. Sounds good. Just bear with us. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Sounds good.
All right, hello? Okay, is it better now? Is it better now? Yeah. Are we good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Chris. Golden Pony Boy. <laughs> what movie is that, huh? You remember that? <laughs> it's the Outsiders. That's just weird. Uh, I catch that reference. How about that? <laughs> okay, so we're good. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on to Silverback Chronicles. Today we have two very important special guests. The one and only, Mr. Ivan Bates, our new state's attorney here in Baltimore City. Appreciate, appreciate you coming on, sir. It means everything. Uh, thank you for having me. Glad, really, really glad to be here. And phenomenal director, Mr. Abrams. Thank you for coming on, sir. Uh, too generous. My pleasure. So uh, I have a monster. Where did that come from? Why the title? Well, we... The title or uh, God, that came from, <laughs> you know, our, our, our main antagonist, Wayne Jenkins himself. It was a term that he used when he would call up people and he would refer to targets, usually people that were uh, involved in some form of drug related activities. And he would call up people within his unit and say, listen, I've got a monster. And that meant that they found they found some that they were going to go target and most likely rob or steal from how did you how did you feel getting everything together on this on this on this movie itself it was it was a lot it was a large overwhelming project i mean we were in production close to six years on this bad boy wow. from discussing initially with bay and brandon the writers who initially brought the attention of the stories to us through pre-production through attempting to sell it through classic streamers and networks to selling it through classic streamers and networks only for it to fall apart and meanwhile filming the whole time and just trying to get as many interviews and stories as we can with people as possible and then through an edit that lasted close to two years wow that's amazing it really is amazing state's attorney sir how did you feel about everything because uh, from my understanding, you've been with uh, Wayne Jenkins on a couple of cases prior to this. Yeah. Um, so I've known Wayne for a long time. I remember him when he was a young uh, officer. Um, he was with another officer, Gladstone, who was a sergeant. So I'd had a number of cases against uh, Wayne Jenkins. And the... The, the documentary allowed, I think it did a good job of showing the entire uh, spectrum of Wayne in terms of his career, how he was there for a while. We talked about the early days. You talked about how he had the opportunity to be suspended as an officer. And then you then looked even deeper into what happened when after he, he went from being almost suspended um, to then being given what I call a whole new life um, being the head of the gun trace task force and the other officers that were there with him. So I like the fact that the documentary brought that up and talked about it and talked about the relationship that, that not only I had with Wayne, but it talked about the relationship that the police department in the city had with Wayne Jenkins. Right. And just as a disclaimer, um, Silverback Chronicles podcast has nothing to do. I know that was his old nickname. Um, our This nickname came about us as a unit we will go to different calls together for safety reasons and also because we you know we're from new york and we always say new york is a concrete jungle 
doing this job, we're working in the concrete jungle, but as a, um, the, our approach for Silverback was not a violent approach, but it was more so solving and helping people of the community by uh, just being intelligent and helping them on calls. So we, I just wanted to put that out there because, you know, I know the name may come across as very violent, but um, it's definitely not. We, we use our brains in helping the community. But um, nice. I have a quick question. So, like, how did you two hook up on this project? Oh, that was all through Baynard and Brandon. They were already talking to Ivan when we came on board. They were interviewing him about stories related to Wayne Jenkins and arrests. And uh, it just was a, a fortunate path crossing. I remember when we first interviewed Ivan, it was the first time he ran for state's attorney. So we had him in his original office in the back room now he had all the posters around him and stuff like that and then um i thought it was just gonna be a one-off interview things changed we kept going deeper and deeper into the story digging in and through that it was inevitable that our path met again and ivan was generous enough to help us start sourcing the victims people that he defended and help us interview them. And that's really when the, the bulk of the story and the, the film for us really began a, to, to come together was when we spoke to the people who defended the people that were the victims of what Wayne Jenkins was doing. And we realized that we really wanted to center the story around what he was doing to help them and the stories of what happened to them so people could understand the repercussions for, for these bad behaviors. Yeah, it's extremely, you know, horrible what they did because of, you know, ultimately it makes it makes our job even harder, right? Correct. To to serve yeah. the way we're supposed to serve. <clears throat> and it definitely left a black cloud over policing in general. Just, you know, just for people to understand like this these guys really corrupted and really did this for a damn near decade, you know, taking advantage of people, loved ones. And, you know, that's why it was paramount that we start this podcast because we wanted people to know, you know, we serve, but we serve the way it's supposed to be served. We take care of people. We respect people. And, you know, I, I appreciate you, you know, Mr. Bates and, and you, Mr. Abram, for what you guys do. Because, again, it's you guys are a beacon and a cornerstone for, 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 you know, what's right. And it should be done right. And people should be happy and, and to confide into police and, you know, let, so that they know that everything, should, that everything is okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. We appreciate you giving us this platform. And I think it's very important for people to understand that there are a number of officers that do serve and they serve honorably. And it's, it's uh, some who have abused that process. I always tell people all the time that good police officers, they cannot stand bad police officers. Absolutely. And so, you know, I think that's one of the things I really realized is this documentary and the book really resonated with so many people who are in law enforcement because they do not like the corruption. Absolutely. Right. You know, I, and I take it from uh, Dr. Umar Jenkins, when he, Dr. Umar Johnson, when he said, if you give a powerless, a powerless person power, they will immediately abuse their authority. And unfortunately, we do have those, you know, those stigmas and those people that come here for the wrong reasons and they just do what they want to do instead of doing what they was taught and trained to do. And therefore, there's always that black stain and dark cloud over police law enforcement worldwide, because even actively in today, I just saw, I think, a video yesterday, I believe, sheriffs in, in uh, California, where yeah. you know, a husband was placed under arrest and the wife is just simply recording the entire incident. So one sheriff leaves his partner, goes over to the wife and just like body slams her for no reason. It's like, what are you doing? Like they, these yeah. guys are just making decisions based off of them being too emotional. Like, what are you doing? There's no need for that. That woman did nothing wrong. There again, his at what he did put himself in that situation. He wasn't professional at all. He took that situation from a zero to a hundred for what? Because you got emotional. She was watching you record the arrest of her husband. That is so mm -hmm. bad. Yeah, no, it's it's I mean, since we told this story, we had what happened with the Scorpion unit down and um, which was videotaped on, you know, camera, a guy getting brutal, brutally beat up. And there's been incidences in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department where they talk about gangs and all sorts of nefarious stuff that went in there as far as corrupt practices with people. 
it's um it's disheartening but also one of the things that we learned in doing the doc was that there's people like you that actually want to correct this problem and i think that's one of the reasons that we're so fortunate to talk to a bunch of law enforcement officers within this or people that were affiliated with law enforcement agencies because they wanted to show that there were people that cared and, and wanted to correct these incidences and let people know that good was still trying to be accomplished absolutely every day absolutely <clears throat> yeah i agree wholeheartedly because you know it, it's not just us it's, it's going to take a village you know it's going to take you you know uh mr bates it's, it's going to take just a whole bunch of us actually putting you know boots to the ground and and serving and doing the right thing and letting people know it's okay they can trust in us but you know it's it's just sad because i know those officers wouldn't train to handle situations like that that was a personal thing you right know, they, they acted as individuals as individuals you know they always they always say you're supposed to act act as if an agent of your department and that is not a clear representation of what good policing is and unfortunately you know, they got burned and they should get fired and they should go to jail for what they did because that's extremely horrible. No, I agree. They weren't, you know, it, it wasn't policing. They just became straight criminals. Absolutely. You no. Know, and, and the sad thing is, you know, Baltimore's had a, a very rough relationship with the police department, with policing. Um, and then you finally see, you know, so many officers trying to make a change. You have Freddie Gray. Then you see, you know, Wayne Jenkins' actions through the documentary. It talks about that, focus on how he, the things that he did. In some ways, some people could say her were heroic. He receives a medal from the police department. But then, even though he does something heroic to try to save other hurt officers who are out there who get hurt during the riot, during, during the uprising, he then basically robs the people, rob the, the, the pharmacists of drugs, and he takes them to his buddy and they sell them. So you just kind of scratch your head, you know, was there, you know, who really was this person? What was, what was this man about? Um, but at the end of the day, the one thing that I think was crystal clear was that there are a number of victims from his actions, not just um, the traditional victim who, you know, say as a person that Wayne Jenkins had robbed, stolen money from, but also victims, i.e. the other officers, the criminal justice system, the police officers, you had the victims, his own family, you know, so many victims that Wayne Jenkins caused hurt tech too. But at the end of the day, you know, it clearly showed that the system took care of him. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I have a question about that. I know in the doc, um, it was stated an integrity test. How would something like that, um, in a way, be carried out so that things like this are prevented? Because he did go after, you know, really bad people. But also another question, two-part question. We all know that when drug dealers do get arrested and they cry, they tend to lie. How do we, how, how's the check and balance? How are we going to level that out to that? An officer who is doing his job, you know, a, a, a criminal says, hey, he stole money. Now that officer is not suspended. How do we work our way through that? Well, I think one of the big things that you do have now that you didn't really have at the beginning, but you see at the end, is body camera footage. Body camera footage used properly is a police officer's best friend. Absolutely. Because the officer comes there and sees the evidence and then packages the evidence properly and then turns it in properly. Body camera footage is, is right there supporting that officer. You know, but then you're always going to have some officers going to look to try to you know, such as with Wayne, he looked to try to go ahead and get over. And so the body camera was not line. And it's funny because on one of these cases, our, uh, Mr. Brown, Arthur Brown, if I'm not mistaken, you know, this the one, the gas station, even though uh, uh, Herschel's wearing body camera, he doesn't know how to operate it. He keeps it on. And because he keeps it on, I'm thinking he turned it off is when you get some of the good, to me, some of the best information about their mindset. So body camera is always a great, great equalizer in terms of what's going on out there. Perfect. And I also think just closer accountability and oversight, you know, if you have an officer as a history of bad behavior, I think that it's part of the responsibility of the force then to be a little bit more stringent 
and looking at their rest reports, looking at the information that's gone in. I mean, one of the things that Ivan did, which was really smart, is that he got his own private detectives to review the information very specifically and say, wait a second, this doesn't add up. This couldn't have happened this way based on the information that's in the report versus the reality of the situation. So I think if there's bad precedents set by officers, we need to just be a little bit more responsible in reviewing everything that they're doing to make sure that the information is adding up. Because if you look at the information as Ivan did in a bunch of cases, it was apparent that things weren't handled correctly. And I think at that point, that's enough to, to warrant either dismissal and or the reopening to reevaluate the arrests and the considerations for how they got, how they behaved. So I think that oversight is gonna be really important to once again also, I think it helps public leaning. I think if people see that the cops are still getting scrutinized in that way, they're going to once again begin to have faith in the system and feel like that there will be accountability on both sides of the conversation. No, I agree. That's absolutely amazing. And that's why it was paramount that they get busted and go to jail, you know, and serve the time because they deserve every bit of it and then some. And hopefully, you know, the public will hopefully that that restored you know, some of the distaste that the public had for these individuals and, you know, definitely give our department a second chance and, you know, earning their trust back because it's it's a tough job, you know, tough job to get out there and serve the way we serve. But when you make it more personal and build that rapport with, with people and they know you're coming from a real space and that you really care about them, you know, it goes a long way in law enforcement. Yeah, one of the things we kept hearing that everybody thought would also be another great way to to create a better conversation between the citizens and the, and the law enforcement side was the notion of going back to officer friendly practices yeah. where people really got to know the citizens that they were patrolling and vice versa, just to open up that conversation. So it was less adversarial and there was more emotional investment on, on those sides. I'm, I'm curious what you guys think of that idea. You know, we, we've always been community policing. We, we were never the officers to stay in our car in a patrol car and just drive past. No, so we will go to one of our hot spots. A hot spot is probably an area where it's heavy drug activity or a lot going on. And we park our patrol car and we get out and we'll go talk to the business owners. We'll talk to the people on the block just to, so they can understand who's policing their area. They know how we are personally as human beings. Because, you know, we're men first before we have this badge. So you always want to develop that rapport and let them know how you are as a man and not even as an officer. And then I think once you build that bridge, it's easier to converse on you being police and what you're here for and what you're going to tolerate, what you're not going to tolerate. But it's a cat and mouse game. And the real ones that understand where you're coming from, from that basis and foundation, it makes the conversation easier. And then once you get along with the business owners and they know you face to face and you're familiar with that area, like I can't tell you countless times me and Jerry was on Bel Air and Ehrman, that was our area. So once we parked our patrol car, we got out the car and we started talking to everybody. Once they knew how we policed, it made things a lot easier. It stopped crime. And not for nothing, if you see these type of officers that, in, that aren't afraid to get out and engage and talk with the community, that's, not, that's, a, that's really a crime deterrent. So you know, once you make it personal on the personal approach, they respect that and they love that and they cherish that if you're there for the right reasons. I think the uh, NCOs do a great job, but unfortunately, um, when the districts hold their community meetings, you don't get the younger population coming to the meetings. So the younger population is the one, you know, it's the it's where the, um, I don't want to say the trouble is because, but that's where the majority of the problems are. Mm -hmm. So the people that attend these community meetings, they are the senior citizens in these communities that care about the communities. So like we're they're missing that that target audience, and then like like you stated, there is no officer friendly, there are no uh, PAL centers, so that's that's really where it's at as far as um, just community engagement. So we're left with just getting out of the car and approaching the corners because that's where you will find the younger the younger population, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where you really get your chance to speak. But you know, calls are going out of control. Um, you know, you, your partner might need a backup. So it's like you don't spend much time to uh, be a positive role model or rather you don't spend much time to for them to understand that you're really there to help. Gotcha. Right. Now that makes sense to me. 
So, Mr. Bates, how do you feel moving forward, sir, about the city? I feel good. You know, look, we we just had a really terrible black guy. Um, yeah, we did. You know, over the holiday weekend. Yeah. Uh, with this mass shooting, I, I want to call it mass hysteria because, you know, I think eventually we're going to find out that it was a lot more going on. What I see is a lot of young people carrying illegal guns. And, you know, that's never going to be a good situation until we really focus and change some of the laws to make sure we can hold the juveniles accountable who want to just carry these guns. We focus and we're doing it with the adults, but we also have to do the same message to the juveniles. You know, we're kind of in a hamster wheel. But outside of that, what I can say is that everybody who's, who cares about the city that's working with the criminal justice system, we're working together. You know, this last, on Monday, we announced a big uh, conviction where a man who, who killed a, a poor lady in front of her children who was working at a convenience store. You know, this guy had a record. We worked with ATF, worked with BPD, and we were able to get a conviction. This man was given life plus 25 years for that murder in front of her children. So those are types of things from a criminal justice standpoint, prosecutor standpoint, I feel like we're making that change, making that turn. But we're also doing a lot in the community to strengthen the community about what's happening. I, de- I definitely like what you said as far as changing the laws for uh, juveniles. I remember growing up in the Bronx when someone came around with a gun, everyone left. Why? Because the gun laws in New York City back then was if you get caught with a handgun, that's an automatic five years. You know, I'm not trying to do five years as, as a 16 year old. Um, no, sorry. I agree. Right. No, I said I agree. So for us, the biggest thing is that I look at it, we're just really trying to be smart on crime. Right. Because we feel like some people, I'm going to be tough on crime. And then some people I feel like, well, I'm not going to hold people accountable. We're saying we're going to be smart, which means we're going to be tough when we need to. We're going to believe in second chance when we need to. But at the end of the day, our number one focus are the victims and public safety and the citizens of the city. And that's where I think we're different. And I think that's what our real focus. So, yeah, I feel very positive about it. You know, I'm one of these people, even with Wayne Jenkins, you know, I wasn't winning those early cases, but I still believe if I kept plugging away, plugging away, plugging away, that we could find a way to hold him accountable. And then, look, I'm a big believer. If you keep plugging away, you'll be able to go ahead and get it in the end. You have to be patient, though, but you can get it in the end. Absolutely. The documentary definitely, and um, also in uh, We on the City, it shows the, uh, the chess match you guys played that, you know, led to, led to this. It was, it's a chess match yeah. at the end of the day, you know? I was lucky we had that to frame the story around. It makes good drama, and Ivan definitely played it really well. But uh, it's it's a, it's a testament too to once again him. You know, one of my favorite things that comes out of the story is how through you know the Freddie Gray case that he was defending Alicia White, he was able to really understand how cops behaved, and through that, he educated himself in different ways to make sure that when he went after Jenkins eventually, he'd be able to really put cases together that were effective and got his people off. And to me, that is a great example of what he was saying earlier about not quitting and to be patient and taking all this information and really begin to to accumulate a great education and how to, to work the system to accomplish what he did, which was to get his innocent uh, clients off and then eventually help get Jenkins behind bars. No, that was amazing. I commend you for that as well. You left no stone unturned with uh, Alicia White's case. And uh, that was found out in that investigation. So I have a question. Uh, um, Mr. Uh-huh. Bates, being that you went through it, and it's clearly uh, well documented in the doc, you went through it from beginning to end. Is there a way, kind of like Cliff Notes, is there a way you're going to hand down a a cliff note kind of style to the rest of your lawyers so that when things like this happen, you know, we're not you're not spending an officer or the victims are not spending, you know, close to, you know, five to seven years to to figure out the truth. Is there a way being that you and, I, and I'm asking you because you actually did it from beginning to end and you know what it takes. Is there a way did you figure out a way that you can go to like, you know, your 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 master class book and be like, okay, so for this, there's a there's a shortcut that we could do. Not shortcut, but there's a there's a way we could find out so we could cut back on time 
and bring justice maybe a little bit quicker because nowadays everybody wants everything fast but we also have to make sure everything's done right correct yeah well there is no shortcut to be honest you have to go through the process you know right now even the state attorney's office we have a shortage of prosecutors and i talk about the oil way the oil way we have to get them we have to train them we have to train them properly and it just takes time there's no 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 shortcut however i think for me the biggest thing that i think is just because a defense attorney says it doesn't mean that it's automatically a lie you know, I was a defense attorney for 20 years, but I also was a prosecutor. A lot of times defense attorneys, they are right there because they're on the ground listening to what's being said right away. And so when you listen to the defense attorney, that doesn't mean you believe them. That means you just at least say, OK, what's going on here? But then when you find everybody saying the same story time and time and time again, that's when you sit down and say, OK, there must be some problem. I think you have to recognize as a prosecutor that your job is to deliver justice and that you work very close with the police officers, but sometimes you may need to sit down and take a difficult look at what the officers are doing. Sometimes it's a training situation, but there may be some times where it's just the corruption as we saw here in Wayne Jenkins. I think you have to be open. You have to look for the um, what's right and don't be afraid to pursue what's right. As long as you do those things, I think you'd be perfectly fine. Outstanding. Well, Mr. Bates, uh, Mr. Abrams, I appreciate you guys taking your time out to you know, shed some more light on this upcoming movie, the doc, and just in general, you know, your time is, is very precious and valuable. And I appreciate, we appreciate you guys taking the time out to come out. And uh, it comes out, what, July 14th, right? Right around the corner. Yeah, theatrically, but you can rent it or buy it right now on Amazon Prime, uh, Apple iTunes, and a bunch of different streaming areas, SVOD. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Bates. It's I definitely appreciate you guys so much, man. This means everything. It's definitely one. Uh, Same. Out right now is the one of the top ten uh, best docs out right Absolutely. now. So well done. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are too kind, and thank you for setting this up. Kevin, your look, I have to say, Kevin and him did a phenomenal job. They were able to sit down and. They were there, but you really didn't know they were there, and they were able to really take the story and tell the story the way it unfolded. So it's really a phenomenal job that Kevin, his whole team at Alpine, that they did, um, and they took years in the making to get this. This is one of the things I think that COVID benefited the process because it gave them more time to look at the product to even make it better than what it was. Mm. So I really, it was a great, phenomenal working experience with Kevin and everybody on this team. No, thanks, bud. And it clearly shows. Well Same. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much. Please enjoy the rest of your day. We look forward to you too. conversing more and uh, hopefully working on some more projects. Right. Hopefully, Mr. Yeah. Abrams, you could come back with the team and show how Baltimore has completely changed. And I, w- I would love story. to. I'm already, I'm already talking with Ivan about that. And listen, I, the one thing I will say... I fell in love with your city oh. with a huge passion. I think it's one of the coolest places on the freaking planet. I am like I'm like your number one fan. I stump all the time for Baltimore. So I would love to come back and listen, I root every day for you guys, man. With, I, I want I want the world to know every day how cool you are. It's not just the wire. This this town is definitely <laughs> special. Um, now that we have a, uh, a a state attorney that's been on both sides, and we also have a new regime with the department, um, things are looking very, very, very uh, on the up and up, as we say. So, yeah, we would love to have you back. Yeah, we would love that, man. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks, you gentlemen. So Thank you. Have that's a great day. Cool. Take care. Peace and love. Right, Thanks. Thanks. Bye.